I'm Ingrid Rosh, and I'm a board member with Sustainable Path Foundation. This is the 11th year that we have sponsored or co-sponsored talks, not always a town hall, different venues previously, but we were formed uh, by a group of scientists, and so we love to fund work that we think is grounded in something measurable and that we'll be able to have something happen that when it does, we'll be able to tell it actually did happen one way or the other. So for the past 11 years, we have been funding organizations that are also interested in what we would call sustainable resiliency. So I've been asked to talk about what we understand about the impacts, the likely impacts of climate change on the Pacific Northwest. And so I want to really call your attention to the fact that when we talk about climate change, there's multiple sides to the coin and multiple things that people talk about. And one really, really important basic issue is about mitigation or emissions reduction. What is our impact on the climate going to be? And so therefore, how much can change can we pro project? I'm not going to talk about that today. And I think Reese's talk is going to be relevant to that about energy use. And, um, and our impact on the climate. What I'm gonna talk about is the other side of things. It's about the changes we've already set in motion and then the changes we are setting in motion with the choices we make every day about our emissions. So the premise, of course, is that human activities have changed the atmosphere, right? We know this. We know that concentrations of some important greenhouse gases are at higher levels than they've been in 800,000 years and that these are caused by human activities. So those changes have committed the climate and our local environmental conditions to centuries of change. And that's the premise underlying the talk I'm giving today. So we know that change has already been set in motion. I'm not gonna spend a lot of time talking about the global issues, but we know that greenhouse gases are at higher levels than in the last 800,000 or million years. We know that global average temperature and global climate has changed. We know that humans have been implicated in this change and that humans are seen as the dominant cause of changes since the mid-century. We also know that changes have been observed locally and, um, and nationally. We have evidence of change that's increasingly visible throughout Earth's natural systems. And so, as I said, there's change detected at the global scale, and because of our ability to do great statistics, we can attribute that change to human activities. And at the national scale, um, but then right here at home, we've seen changes in our climate and in our natural, natural systems that are consistent with what we'd expect from a changing climate. So we've seen long-term increases in temperature, long-term um, decreases in snowpack and changes in stream flow timing and decreases in glaciers and increases in ocean acidification in our Pacific Northwest that are consistent with the kinds of changes we'd expect from global climate change, but the jury is out on how much of those were actually caused by that and how much us and how much were caused by natural variations. So when we look here at the Northwest right now, we are seeing the combined influence of our variable nature and the human influences pushing us into a new future. But as we look forward, it's, ex it's exceedingly clear that the new future we're moving into is gonna be quite a bit different than the past. So for the global scale and for the Northwest, the question is no longer if climate will change, but how fast and how much. And this is just a schematic showing you global temperature projections. It doesn't matter exactly what it looks like, um, what the numbers are, but the point is that the first part of this record, the gray, is showing the small increase in global average temperature observed over the 20th, 20th century. And then all those different colored lines are potential futures uh, for the globe over the 21st century. Why are there different futures? Because what happens depends on our choices today and tomorrow about how much greenhouse gases we emit and how fast and which types. And so depending on our choices, we can see a future of warming anywhere between about two and seven degrees um, Fahrenheit later in the century. But the point I wanna make here is not to dwell on the global stuff, but to use this as the framework for our talking about local impacts. And the point to take home from this again is that under all scenarios that are examined, it's getting warmer. It's going to get warmer, and that's the case for the Northwest as, as well. 
So for the rest of the talk, I want to really focus in on what we know about projected changes in Northwest climate and the implications of those changes. And as was mentioned in my introduction, a lot of this is based on the recent national climate assessment that was released in the spring. I have a couple of um, copies of the highlights from that at the front table if you want to page through them. Um, and this is a sort of... Uh, one of the most recent looks at what climate change means for our region. So similar to the global story, when we look here in the Northwest, all scenarios project warming. And again, the amount of warming, the rate of warming depends on our choices about emissions. But um, here's a similar figure to what I showed you before, showing you in gray the um, observed temperature changes from 1950 to the present day, and then two different scenarios for future warming, blue and red, that again, one is lower greenhouse gas emissions, one is higher, um, both indicate warming. Um, to give you actual numbers for the 2050s, the range is about four to six degrees compared to last century. Um, for warming in the Northwest. And I'd like to spend the rest of the talk sort of unpacking what this really means. Are those big? Does it matter? What's the impact likely to be? But first, let's talk about these drivers. So another thing we can get out of global climate models is what precipitation is likely to do, right? So we care not only how warm it is, but how much it rains and when. And I think the short story is kind of same as before, but more of it. So the precipitation changes we're looking at are not such a dramatic change as the temperature changes I've just shown you. So we're likely to see very slightly wetter years on average by the end of the century, but hardly discernible compared to our normal switches back and forth between really wet years and really dry years. Um, what we might see uh, more is this sort of emphasis on our typical Northwest seasonality, which is that fall, winter, and spring, when it's wet, will tend to get wetter, and summer, when it's tend to get dry, when it tends to be dry, will tend to get drier, and when we have heavy rainfall events, we're likely to have more of those with more precipitation. So these are the sort of the big influences from the global climate changes set in motion for the region, and then we unpack what they mean for our place and things we care about by using additional simulation models and analyses to see what the impacts might be. Oh, there's a picture to remind me to tell you where this came from. Um, so we have a global cl uh, national climate assessment that came out in the spring, and then a longer book-length version focused just on the Northwest that came out in the fall that's available from Island Press. All these are available freely online. And then a more recent sort of synopsis of technical uh, summary of this for decision makers that our group put out um, in December. So there's a lot we know about local impacts of climate change. And I think sometimes people are a little surprised at the kind of detail we have and the information we can use to inform our risk assessment and planning. And I could talk for a really long time about these, these impacts, but I'm gonna confine my focus today to the three major risks that we outlined in the National Climate Assessment. So in that assessment report for the Northwest chapter, we thought we'd look at what's most important. What do we think the biggest impacts of climate change are likely to be on the Northwest in terms of their consequences for ecosystems, for people's health, for infrastructure, and our economy, for the re region writ large. And we identified three major risks. One is um, related to drought, the combined impact, uh, I mean the impact of warming temperatures on our water supply. The, another one was the combined impact in the coastal areas of all the fa factors that climate change will bring there, sea level rise and floods and erosion and um, chemical and ecological changes in the ocean. The third major risk area was forest disturbance and the combined impacts those will have on our forested landscapes. We also uh, spent some time talking about impacts on agriculture, which is not a bad news story, is actually a very interesting story because agriculture is pretty resilient and the impacts are likely to be relatively modest, but because ag is so important to this um, region, we wanted to make sure we um, talked through what the likely impacts would be. I'm not gonna talk about that in my presentation, but I'm happy to ask, answer questions later. I'll ask some too, I'm sure. So let's talk through these um, one by one. I wanna focus first on the, the risks that are related to changing water supply because they actually underlie almost all of the other impacts of climate change that we understand in this region. So 
the bottom line message is that these expected changes in temperature especially, and a little bit of precipitation, will transform many mountain watersheds in the west, across the western US, and transform the hydrologic characteristics um, that we as people depend on in our watersheds and that our plants and animals um, do as well. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about the impacts of warming on, on our region's hydrology. So we have here in the Northwest among the highest proportion of what we call warm snow in the US. What's warm snow? Snow that's near the current snow line, right? So if it warms up a little bit, the snow line goes up, that snow is lost. We, um, and so that is the root of much of our sensitivity to climate change. And under all scenarios which show warming, all scenarios also show significant loss of mountain snowpack, up to around 40% in the middle of the century, 65% loss of um, snowpack in Washington state um, later in the century. So that's important by and of itself, right? If you care about snow, if you're like, <laughs> Crystal and I, we go skiing, if you, you know, any other reasons you might care about snow, but it's also really important for our hydrology. So this is a, a figure showing you um, one, I'm picking on the Yakima Basin, but this could be any sort of mid-elevation basin in our state, showing you the typical pattern of stream flow in that basin. So in that basin, it tends to rain in the winter around October, and so you have some stream flow then. And um, then the snow accumulates in the mountains, melting in the spring, where the spring peak flows. Um, and then the summer snow melt decreases over time, right? So the summer low flow period. So that's sort of natural as if they weren't any dams. And as it warms, you'd expect more winter rains, uh, earlier spring peak, and less summer snow melt, right? Because there was less snow. So here's how it steps through in time. So under a middle emission scenario, the 2020s, you see that pattern starting to happen, the 2040s, and the 2080s. So for these mid-elevation watersheds, I don't think I was exaggerating when I talked about a dra dramatic transformation of the fundamental characteristic of the watershed. And we have built our um, water resource management and other water use expectations around a certain timing of water availability. And of course, the ecosystems, plants and animals here um, grew up with a certain kind of water supply in mind. We also know that the summer um, snowmelt period, the low flow period is especially um, problematic in many of our watersheds with a lot of conflicts over uses at that time. So likely to be rather challenging. Okay, so let's talk about what some of the impacts of those, of those changes are. Um, uh, one concern is often hydropower production because of our dependence on hydropower. And so with this shift in timing of stream flow, if you operate the dams and reservoirs exactly as you operate them now, you're not gonna be able to make as much hydropower in the summer in, um, for example, the Columbia Basin where, this, where studies have been done. We're um, likely to see decreased irrigation supply reliability, right? Because a lot of our irrigation, our delivery of irrigation water in the summer depends in large part on having the snowmelt delivery of that water. Um, the municipal uh, water supply companies, utilities such as Portland Water Bureau, Seattle Public Utilities, and others that have looked at the issues of climate change for their ability to meet municipal water demand have said that they're in pretty good shape and that for um, several decades into the century they expect to be able to meet demand despite shifts in snowpack and snowmelt timing because of flexibility and buffers in their system. Longer term than that, I think they're looking seriously about what the impacts might be. I said that another big uh, risk factor was um, the combined, it was the impacts on our forested landscapes. As we have warmer temperatures, we expect an increased risk of wildfires, more area burned, and one projection is for a doubling of the area burned in the Columbia Basin by the 2020s up to about a quintupling by the end of the century under these sort of medium emission scenarios. Um, we see increased risk of insect outbreaks. Forest insects are sensitive to temperature, and um, as temperatures change, can um, complete more um, 
life cycles in a year, and um, trees are also less able to defend against these outbreaks as they're under increasing drought stress. And then um, I think we need to remember, of course, the serious potential ecological, ecological, economic, and human impacts. We don't need to look very far back in time to this past summer to know really what fire can mean for our communities. Mm -hmm. I'm going to talk about coastal impacts and sea level rise. The main driver of coastal impacts is, of course, sea level rise. And when we think about what the local magnitude of sea level rise is, we have to know something also about what our local land is doing. It turns out, because of um, interesting tectonic and geological processes, different parts of our coast are uplifting and other parts are subsiding. So some parts are moving upward so fast that sea level is going down there right now, like at Nia Bay. And other parts, like South Puget Sound, are subsiding so that sea level um, rise adds to that and compounds the factors. So um, we have some information about the local land movement combined with our regional sea level rise scenarios. And we see a range of, um, of sea level projected, uh, sea level rise projected for Seattle, for example, this century. And in these assessments, we sort of un unwound the multiple impacts and consequences of this for both ecological and human systems. One good example of this is inundation of low-lying areas. There's about 140,000 acres in Washington and Oregon that are within three feet of high, of high tide. So as sea level increases and you have high tide on top of that, they're at increased risk of inundation. Coastal wetlands are subject to squeeze between rising ski seas and um, coastal development. And um, these kinds of impact pathways are important as well for our coastal transportation networks and coastal communities. When we think forward about trying to prepare for these impacts though, we don't focus much or only on the sort of creeping impacts of sea level rise. We think more about the combined impacts of having a higher sea, having some river floods, having a high tide, and having a storm. So it's the combined impacts of these multiple factors that we're really encouraging planners and decision makers to take into account when they're trying to build systems that are resilient to these. So we've also looked at imp implications for ecosystems. I've talked a lot about sort of impacts on people here. Um, we could unpack that more in the Q&A. And I mentioned in passing flood risk, which is um, a concern for east of the Cascades and fall and winter as these extreme precipitation events increase. But let's go forward so I can just spend a couple minutes talking about what people are doing about this. Okay, so let's not just make a laundry list of all the, all the things that could happen and what the problems might be. Let's, um, what our goal is, is to articulate those potential impacts well enough so that we can enable a community and a planning discussion about how best to prepare for those in order to reduce the negative impacts and you know, um, find any opportunities we might. And what I want to give is some examples. Um, I, I, one thing that people are very surprised about when they, when they <laughs> talk to me about this uh, often, is the level of engagement that's happening right now in all levels of our government to prepare for the impacts of climate change, beginning with assessing what the, might, the risks might be, planning out approaches to deal with them, and um, then implementing some changes. And so what I just want to give you about uh, is a glimpse. I mean, this is, I could go on a, for a really long time about all the innovative things that's been going on here, but just to give you a glimpse and some heart that this is being considered. So local municipalities, like Seattle, are developing adaptation plans. They're assessing the climate risk for infrastructure investments. They're incorporating sea level rise projections in redevelopment projects and infrastructure decisions. And this is a map that um, Seattle Public Public Utilities has produced looking at areas of potential inundation or flooding uh, under different sea level rise scenarios that they're using to assess the risks to their utility um, assets, such as stormwater outfalls um, and other coastal assets. This is just one example. Olympia has done a lot of work on this. The Port of Bellingham is doing a major redevelopment on Bellingham Bay, and they have re-sited um, some of the development and regraded. Uh, redesigned the grading of the site with sea level rise projections in mind. 
Um, so I guess I've, I've mentioned already that public and private electric and water utilities are looking at climate impacts on their supply side and demand side, and I won't say any more because Crystal's here to talk about that some more. Uh, so there's uh, sta uh, the states are developing response strategies, not all the states in the country, of course, but Washington is among um, the leaders in this. Um, so looking overarching and what the responsibility of state agencies might be to prepare for these impacts. And then, and that, so the state of Washington has done that and they're in the process of individual agencies developing their agency specific plans and incorporating climate change and embedding it into many of their long-term planning and risk assessment assessments and uh, some cross state collaborations uh, as well. And then the um, Obama um, presidential task force of state, local, and tribal leaders on climate preparedness and resilience um, that Governor Inslee is on is going to be re releasing its recommendations, I think, on November 17th. So this is just one example of many. Um, and it's a talking point here, really. It's I know it's a map that's impossible to read. But I want to uh, hold up Washington De uh, Department of Transportation as one of the leaders in our state agencies and looking at what climate change means for them. So they did a methodical look at state-owned transportation assets, and they engaged their managers and their operations folks across the state in every region to understand why climate change might affect different parts of the transportation infrastructure and what would happen if it did. I mean, does it matter? Is that a critical link or not? And so they have a map where they ranked everything according to levels of vulnerability. And the good news is, in general, they're quite uh, resilient to the projected impacts. Um, they do see vulnerabilities in every region, and they learn some surprising things. People often think about bridges. Maybe they're not built big enough to handle the increased flood fl flows. But with this careful look, WashDOT saw that it's the approaches to their bridges that are more vulnerable, more likely to get washed away, not the bridge itself. And it's this kind of drilling down that people are increasingly doing now, which is what we really need to understand where it's worth spending our time and money to prepare for these impacts and what the, the serious ones are likely to be and which ones aren't. I think it's kind of easy for people to imagine why climate change might matter for ecosystems or species that are more or less rooted in place, given the time of change we're talking about, um, forests that have um, grown up under specific climate conditions, fish that live in a place because of the conditions that are there. And maybe it's harder to see what it matters for us. And I think it's really important to realize that we have embedded climate expectations in most of our plans, policies, procedures, and infrastructure. We have unexamined assumptions about what the future climate's going to look like in how big uh, this is examined by water resource engineers, but maybe not by normal people on the street. How big is the dam? How much water do we need to store for people to drink in the summer? What kind of a bridge do we need to cross a lake in a storm? When can we go skiing? What's the viability or return on investment for new investments in ski areas? How what can, what can we plant where and what grows well where? All of these things have embedded climate expectations, and the challenge that climate change brings is that it's turning all those expectations false, right? They're wrong. We assume the climate's going to be like it was, and it won't. So our challenge here in preparing for climate change is to really encourage this discussion about uncovering those and saying, as the climate changes, how are we going to reorient and realign for these parts that are unavoidable and already set in motion? And is it that's hard enough? Let's talk even more seriously about what we're doing to prevent future change. We have many, many tools in hand to do this. We have locally specific projections. We have local expertise in our um, utilities and agencies who are looking at these issues. So we are not, we, we started this years ago and people are working hard on it. So there's lots to hold up and be proud of and to leaders to follow, but there's much, much more work to be done. And that is the end of my part. Thank you for helping with the slides. And I'm going to pass it to Crystal. I think we have questions later. Thank you. Hey, my name's Crystal Raymond, and I am from Seattle City Light, where I work on climate adaptation and climate research for the utility. Um, before I start, I have a quick question. It's a little bit hard to see the audience. But how many people here are from the city of Seattle? Raise your hand. 
All right, most people. Okay, hold your hands up. No, keep your hands up. Okay, how many people know where their, how their electricity is generated, where the power comes from? Keep your hand up if you know the answer. Yeah, that's pretty good. Yeah, fair amount of people know. All right. I'll admit, um, before I worked for Seattle City Light, I didn't actually know where our power came from. So it's very interesting to learn that. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about uh, Seattle City Light's um, climate change awareness and our new climate change program. So just for those of you who don't know um, where Seattle City Light's power comes from, so we are the municipally owned um, electric utility for the city of Seattle. And our power is 90% hydropower. About 50% of the hydropower comes from two dams or hydroelectric projects that are owned and operated by the city of Seattle. One is the Skagit Project, which is up in the North Cascades, is actually within North Cascades National Park. And the other is um, the Boundary Project, which is located on the Ponderay River and is part of the Columbia River system in Eastern Washington. Um, and in addition to that, our power comes from kind of power purchases from BPA or other contracts with other utilities. And um, these are the sources of power for the city of Seattle and a few surrounding areas. Um, and there's a couple of important things to note about power for the city of Seattle that's relevant for climate change. Um, one is that the city is actually still currently a winter peaking utility. So that means right now we actually use more power in the winter time for heating than we do for cooling in the summertime. Um, another important thing to know about City Light is that we do operate a transmission system, so we do actually maintain transmission from these projects, which brings the electricity to the city of Seattle, and then of course the distribution system that brings the power to you know, your house. So um, in, at Seattle City Light, as part of the strategic plan for the utility that was passed in 2012, um, the utility included a new climate change initiative. And this has two key components. One is climate change research. Um, and the idea here is to um, improve understanding of how climate change will affect the electric utility. And then the second part of that initiative is to take that information and use it in an adaptation planning process. So as Amy talked about, um, really looking at how the impacts affect us and then what we would do as a utility to prepare for those impacts. So this is very much focused on kind of the research and the adaptation side of climate change. Okay, and I will say um, on the mitigation side, I did want to make um, a mention of Seattle City Light's carbon neutrality. So some of you um, may know that Seattle City Light is carbon neutral. Um, we've been carbon neutral since uh, 2005, so that basically means we have net zero emissions of greenhouse gases. And um, City Light has done this through a few different strategies. One is um, conservation, a very uh, strong conservation program to reduce electricity use. Also increasing the amount of renewable energy sources in our power mix. And then also with the purchase of carbon offsets. And this is basically um, purchasing uh, a certain amount of um, carbon storage to make up for the amount of emissions that are released. And for carbon offsets, City Light focuses on local projects um, that can be carefully monitored. Um, and we do an inventory each year, a verified inventory, to know what our carbon emissions are, and then we purchase offsets. And uh, some examples of offsets we've purchased is um, shore power, which is basically allowing cruise ships to plug in and get electricity to operate the cruise ships when they're in the port of Seattle rather than using diesel, or um, methane recapture at dairy farms, which basically prevents methane from going into the atmosphere, which is a really potent greenhouse gas. Um, City of Seattle uh, is also developing an adaptation plan. So we're just the electric utility, one department of the city. Um, but the city is doing uh, uh, an adaptation plan for the entire city. And before doing this, they did a survey of the city of Seattle to find out generally what all of you think about climate change. Um, and this was motivated by the fact that there was a general sense um, within the city that perhaps uh, regional or even national surveys of what people think about climate change don't reflect what people in Seattle think. So um, the city of Seattle took it upon themselves to do this survey. It was about 603 voters in Seattle done in June 2013. And I'll just 
point on a couple of highlights. Um, I can maybe answer more questions about this in the question and answer if people are interested, although this isn't my area of expertise. Um, but I will say that um, <clears throat> it was really interesting to see that, in fact, 56% of um, people in Seattle think that addressing climate change is important, um, extremely or very important. So that was a fairly high percentage. And this changed somewhat if people were asked whether they thought it was important for Seattle to do their part to address climate change or to be a leader. And the numbers were still high, but generally people felt more like it was important to do our part to address climate change. Um, but there was a fair amount of the population who also agreed that we should be a, a leader as a city um, for the rest of the nation in addressing climate change. So in terms of this mitigation and adaptation issue, um, two sides of the coin. So people in the survey were asked if they thought it was more important for the city to do mitigation, um, that is, to address climate change through reducing emissions, or to prepare for the worsening impacts of climate change. So that's adaptation. And generally, the city um, was fairly split on this issue. The people surveyed were fairly split, although um, a greater part of the people surveyed felt like it was more important for the city to prepare for the impacts of climate change. So now, um, kind of with that background and sort of where you can see you know, where, where all of you think, hopefully you're represented by that survey in some way, um, I want to go into a little bit more detail about um, the impacts to Seattle City Light specifically. So just the electri uh, electric utility component of this. So the main impacts that we have looked at so far as a utility are impacts on hydropower generation and demand. And we've done, um, in working with climate impact groups and others, we've done some preliminary analysis of this, and part of our research program is to expand on that analysis. Um, but one of the main things we've looked at are these seasonal changes in hydropower generation. So um, what this picture shows you is uh, kind of examples of the objectives for which we manage our project. Um, this is particularly here photos from the Skagit project in the North Cascades. And so a lot of people think, well, we generate hydropower, but we actually do a lot more. Um, these dams are also used for flood control. They're used to maintain recreation levels for recreation, and they're used to provide in-stream flows for fish protection. And so those four objectives are carefully balanced at the project. And you know, as Amy was describing, that whole balance of managing those four objectives is based on the climate of the past. And so now the question that we have moving forward is, okay, how do we continue to balance these objectives knowing that the snowpack, the stream flow, the glaciers in this area are going to be changing? And so the real question is here, how do we continue to meet multiple objectives, protect fish, maintain reservoir levels um, with, that, with that timing changing? Um, so some of the things that we expect to see are less water availability in summer, so greater challenges for maintaining in-stream flows for fish and reservoir levels. Um, and also with more heavy precipitation rain, uh, precipitation events, uh, the potential for increased flood risk. From the demand side, um, preliminary analysis shows that we would expect to see uh, increase in demand for electricity in summer, but decreases in winter. And we are also looking at the impacts to our transmission and distribution system. Um, and so, you know, our system is affected by many aspects of climate. And um, we are looking at things like uh, flooding and storm surge, also wildfires and landslides, how those might impact the system, particularly transmission from the North Cascades. And then also um, wind and lightning. Um, this is probably the number one or the, num the two most um, climate-related risks that the system faces. And so this is an area where we're pursuing more research to better understand how wind and convective storm patterns could change so we know how that affects our distribution system. So that, I think, um, most of what we've told you so far, I've heard it described as climate hell. So this is my one slide where I want to give you a little bit of climate heaven. So these are my reasons to be optimistic. And I, and I do think that there are some reasons to be optimistic. And just to give you three um, that I've noticed from Seattle City Light. One is that City Light uh, does a really good job of managing climatic variability. So we have a lot of tools and processes in place to deal with the fact that wind is extremely variable. Uh, snowpack is extremely variable in the Pacific Northwest, and we have adapted to that. So we have an opportunity to leverage those tools in dealing with climate change moving forward. 
Um, another reason for optimism is um, kind of also, as Amy pointed out, I think this momentum on adaptation has really accelerated in the last few years. Um, I was recently down in California. This was an adaptation forum for the state of California. So one state um, just focused on adaptation for climate change, and there were over 800 people there, which I think is quite a bit for you know one topic, one state, and the energy was, was just really incredible. And so I think we have a sense now that people feel this is an issue that they can start to plan for and do something tangible about. Um, I also think that there's a lot to be said for fuel efficiency and renewable technology. And, I, and I've also seen this accelerate too. Um, and I think that you know, it, it's part of the solution. And I think when, we, when people have this image, when they think about, well, the only thing I can do to deal with climate change is it's kind of like Fred Flintstone. You, know, you go back to that car where your feet are running underneath the car and it's from the Stone Age, right? That doesn't really work very well when people think about addressing climate change. But the notion of, say, the new BMW i3, right, that's made out of carbon fiber and bamboo and is incredibly fuel efficient, there is something that starts to kind of resonate with people, like this isn't completely giving up the quality of life that I want. There are technological changes that are gonna help us deal with the problem. Now that's only gonna be one, one piece of the puzzle, but I think there are solutions emerging, and I think that really helps the conversation here. Um, so uh, just to talk a little bit about my three points on what I think you can do about it. So one of the simple ones is Seattle City Light does have a lot of programs to increase renewable energy. Um, use through the city. One is simply green up, supporting renewable energy through your utility bill. We have community solar programs, which um, if you don't want to go out and put solar cells, solar panels on your house, you can contribute money to a community project. We've put solar cells on um, buildings at the zoo and the aquarium. Um, and then there is customer generation or the sort of option of putting solar cells, um, solar power your own house. And so those are sort of three levels of involvement if you want to do something on that end. Um, two other uh, items here are a little bit less tangible. One is just get to know the basics of climate science. And um, this was something that I heard from the mayor of Lancaster, Pen uh, Lancaster California, Rex Paris. Um, if you get a chance, kind of Google him online. And basically, he is a Republican mayor of a very Republican city. And he um, really kind of changed his thinking on climate change when he understood the basic science. And I have a picture there of um, a Swedish physicist. I, I won't pronounce his name. But basically, in 1906, he calculated that if we doubled the amount of CO2 in the atmosphere, we would raise the Earth's temperature by 4 degrees. That was in 1906 that he calculated that. And it's within the range of what modern climate models project. And my point here is that um, there's some real basic science here. This notion that CO2 can warm the Earth is not um, really uh, something that's just you know, a function of the models, and it's really that complicated. It's basic science. And so if you understand some of the fundamentals, then when you have the conversation you know, with your sort of non-believing relative, you can say, well, this is the science, as opposed to just, this is my belief against your belief. Because if we stay in that conversation, I think it gets really hard to move away from that. And I, and I was really impressed by that point. So check out his presentations online if you want to see a little more on that. The last thing I will say is voice your concern about climate change. If, you're, if this is an issue that matters for you, um, you could see by that survey that the city is listening. Um, Seattle City Light does answer to the city council, um, and so the city council is listening on this issue. So just be active in, in your community and voice your concerns about this issue, and I think that there are people listening. So lastly, um, I want to say, why do I do this job? I was recently um, interviewed for an NPR story, and I was asked that question. And so now I'm prepared with an answer, thinking about it a little bit more. So why do I do my job? Well, there's three reasons. Um, one is I am a backcountry skier. I love to go to the snow. I love to go to the mountains. And I want to make sure that those types of experiences continue to be there um, for people in the future. Um, and this, I, I don't have any children, but this is a picture of my nephews. You get to see my nephews, because I, I don't have children of my own. But you know, one of the reasons I do this job is because I think about their future and what we're going to leave for them. And I think about, you know, my youngest nephew is five years old, and um, if he comes to visit me in 15 years, he lives in Vermont. If he comes to visit me in 15 years, could I take him to Snoqualmie Pass to go skiing? 
Maybe not, you know, but could I take him to Mount Rainier and he'd still be able to see the glaciers from paradise? Hopefully. Yeah. You know, that's, that's going to be possible. So I guess, you know, I'd encourage people to, to realize that it isn't just about us in the room and, and think about the next generation. And then lastly, I have this picture there from the North Cascades. Um, and one of the reasons that I do this job is although, you know, you may have heard a lot in the media where some people might say, well, you know, the impacts in the Northwest aren't going to be as bad as other places in the country or other places in the world. And there is some truth to that. We might have less impacts in some ways. But this is the place that I live. It's a place that I really care about. And we will have some, some real impacts. And so my sense of place and need to work on these issues in this place is something that really motivates me. Thank you. So infrastructure um, is what I'm going to talk about. And it's uh, for most people, I'm sure not for you because you're highly informed, um, caring people. But for most people, it's they, I say, I'm, I'm, I've started this new center for sustainable infrastructure. I'm super excited about it. And they're kind of like, whoa, what infrastructure? Nobody knows what the word means. And they don't even think about it. And we take for granted, you know, when we turn on the lights or uh, we turn on the tap, we got clean water, we got electricity. When we flush the toilet, we pretty much count on that going where it needs to go. The garbage will get taken away. Um, but, but really, this is vitally important stuff. It's very important for economic development, um, uh, for, for, the, for our businesses and, the, and our local economy. Uh, really depends on high quality infrastructure. Um, having affordable infrastructure for our residents and for our businesses is key. Uh, it's a real job creator and a job sustainer. Uh, Brookings recent studies found that 11% uh, of employment nationwide, 11% is infrastructure jobs, uh, mostly in maintaining and operating infrastructure uh, rather than constructing it. Um, and it's a real, uh, you know, a good, good investment in smart infrastructure can attract real estate investment, new business investment, vitally important for economic development. It's also vitally important for our environment, vitally important for our quality of life. And we could bullet out a, a list of, them, uh, of, of the ways that that's important in these other areas. Certainly, climate change, reducing our greenhouse gas emissions, uh, enhancing our climate resiliency, infrastructure touches on those in profound ways that we'll talk about a little bit more. First thing we got to to, to face is that we're facing an, uh, an infrastructure deficit. A lot of our infrastructure was built in the post-World War II era, uh, decades of, of capital investment in these systems, built world-class systems, uh, in some ways very sprawling systems that, that spread out uh, very far. And we didn't necessarily build in um, the revenue sources to maintain that infrastructure uh, on a continuous basis. And Federal funding sources and state funding sources for infrastructure investment have been drying up. And we're finding ourselves, uh, in a lot of cases, um, with, with O&M budgets, operation and maintenance budgets that are, that are lagging. These systems are aging. They're decades old. They need renewal. And, and we don't have the money to renew them necessarily built into the pipeline. And, um, and we're having to defer maintenance. And if you defer maintenance, rather than maintaining it on a regular schedule, the cost is going to be two to, two to four times as much, depending on the infrastructure type, in order to get it back into working order. Uh, so we have a lot at stake here. And we really need to innovate. And I think there's a growing recognition um, in the infrastructure sectors across. And, and, and the center is really looking at energy infrastructure, transportation infrastructure, all the water-related systems, stormwater, wastewater, drinking water and waste management systems. Across all those infrastructures, there's a growing recognition that we, we can't simply replicate what we've done in the past. Uh, we really need to innovate. Uh, Peter Binney is the uh, winner of the President's Medal with, for the American Society of Civil Engineers. Uh, and he says, we're making decisions today that we'll live with for 50 years. We can't keep doing the things, things the, the way that we have. He helped design sort of uh, the, everybody heard of LEEDS, the Green Building LEEDS rating system silver, gold, platinum, green buildings. Uh, he, he helped develop a similar rating system called Envision for, for sustainable infrastructure projects. Um, so the purpose of the center is really to help turn the ship and, and bring about a new paradigm and a new practice in sustainable infrastructure. 
and for the Northwest to lead. We want to see Oregon and Washington really be pioneers and uh, world-class innovators in sustainable infrastructure innovation. So my first order of business in starting this new center was to go out and talk to the people who really know what's going on or at the forefront of innovation. So I talked to, uh, it was going to be 40, it turned out to be 70 thought leaders and innovators from Oregon, Washington, and British Columbia. Formally interviewed them. Uh, they spanned each of the sectors, energy, transportation, water, and waste, and, and some people who kind of worked across those sectors. And I've been working over the last couple months to distill and synthesize their insights into a special report that points the way to a sustainable infrastructure future. Um, and it's really about providing some guidance and inspiration, not only to the decision makers and policy makers and the people in the field in these agencies and utilities today, but also uh, the next generation. We are talking about um, intergenerational investments. Uh, these are the longest lived capital investments that we make together. They're public investments, and we have an aging workforce, and we really need to bring fresh ideas, fresh energy, uh, fresh blood into these, into these systems, into these agencies. Okay, this is really important because we are gonna be spending staggering sums on infrastructure just to keep these systems operating in the coming decades. We're gonna have to, no matter what. Uh, otherwise, our society and our economy is not really going to be able to function very well. Globally, the McKinsey uh, Company, uh, global consulting firm, estimates it's in the order of $57 trillion by 2030 just to keep pace with GDP growth, not even factoring in the need for climate resilience, the need to reduce carbon emissions, just to keep pace with GDP growth. Along the Pacific Coast, we're talking about a trillion dollars. Uh, from California to British Columbia, according to CH2M Hill in the next 30 years. So uh, a lot of money is going to be flowing into these uh, systems. So principles for how we invest this money smart. Um, the Triple Crown is fiscally sound, um, affordable, uh, resilient, and sustainable. So how do we optimize for those three uh, goals at the same time? So uh, affordability, really means for, for residents and businesses over the long haul. It's not just about the capital cost of an investment up front. It's really about the operations and maintenance together with the capital cost. A lot of times the best solutions may cost a little bit more up front, but these are long-lived systems that we can finance over time. They're going to make, from a whole systems perspective, they are going to save us significant amounts of money. Um, second, superior envir environmental performance. Talk about that in a sec. And then third, resilience in the face of the kind of major disrupt disruptive events, whether it's terrorism potential or the kinds of climate changes and climate impacts that, that Amy and Crystal have been talking about. If you want to add a quadruple crown, the fourth crown would be um, at the same time as we're achieving affordability, resilience, and sustainability, sustainability, let's find solutions that have multiple community-wide benefits that extend even beyond the particular silo and system that we're uh, we're planning for it uh, in this particular case. So uh, some of the key environmental metrics would be the green maximizing uh, capture of the energy efficiency or water efficiency resource uh, and, and using locally renewable resources, using clean sources of water, energy, and materials, little or no greenhouse gas emissions. Just to note on materials, the waste, the the, that our solid waste agencies uh, manage, when they're thinking about um, how, do we, how do we manage that smarter? Waste reduction, recycling um, are at the top of the list. And, but when you look at the traditional greenhouse gas inventory for our state, where are the emissions coming from in our state? Uh, and you look at landfills and, and all the waste that we dump, um, it's only about one or 2% come from landfills or incinerators. So, it, it looks like not very significant amount, but Oregon Department of Environmental Quality did sort of a life cycle analysis of the materials that are going into the products that we are throwing away that end up in our land, landfills. And if you look at from extraction to processing to transport uh, to packaging, uh, all of that together, materials, that material flow makes up about 41% of Oregon's greenhouse gas emissions, the emissions that Oregonians are responsible for. So, so that waste or material piece is a key piece too. 
Um, sustainable infrastructure investments will also have little or no release of toxic pollutants, and in many cases will result in enhanced and restored natural systems. The red, um, we need to also at the same time be optimizing to, for, for the systems to be able to resist catastrophic cascading failures and recover quickly in the event of, uh, uh, of, of a, an event that brings it down to get back online quickly. So in a lot of cases, distributed systems rather than centralized systems can, can bring some benefits in resiliency. Second principle, encourage silo busting. These electricity, water, heat, transport, uh, parks, disaster response, um, all these different silos are typically managed with their own budgets, their own staff, their own mission and imperatives. Uh, when, if we were just able to figure out how to collaborate across the, those departmental lines, we could really treat more of these systems as an integrated whole and find very valuable synergies. Very difficult to do, but very, very important as we look forward to how we're gonna change the way we invest in our infrastructure systems. So when we're, when we're looking at making an investment in these systems, before committing real money, a, a good investor is gonna look at, they're gonna vet several alternative investments. What's the smartest way that I could spend this money? Um, if I invest it here, these are the kind of returns I'll get, but these are the kind of risks. If I invest over here, I'll get maybe lower returns, but lower risk. Um, and there, in the case of infrastructure investments, before we, before early in the planning process, before we commit to a standard business as usual kind of infrastructure investment, we really need to invite innovative ideas, uh, think out of the box, look at, look at sort of best practices from around the country, and consider some different ways to get at solutions to the challenges uh, that we're trying to address and thoroughly compare those options. Seattle Public Utilities is a national leader in this. They have five full-time economists on staff, and they really have taken this as a discipline. Before they build a new substation or a, a pump house or, or whatever the, the investment is needed, they're gonna look at some different ways to solve this, to skin the cat and solve the problem, and measure those uh, full cost benefits, not only within the infrastructure silo, whether it's, uh, water supply, whether it's uh, storm water, um, whether it's the waste management utility, but also to government as a whole. What's the, what are the costs and benefits to government as a whole of this decision and to the community as a whole? And they'll even look at you know, the, the broader global community and they'll look at issues of equity. So Seattle Public Utility is a real leader in this. All right, uh, anybody remember the show Get Smart? All right, so uh, Maxwell Smart. I had a picture of Maxwell Smart up there, and I was gonna, you know, huh? We, yeah, and, he, and he's got the, he was on the cutting edge of technology. He was way ahead of the iPhone. He had it in his shoe, which, you know, for Steve Jobs decided that wouldn't be a big winner, or, you know, super convenient. But, you know, today people are carrying devices in their pocket that have uh, unbelievable information, communication, sensoring capabilities. Um, and advanced, these kind of advanced technologies are beginning to transform industry after industry after industry. And, and in some ways, I think our infrastructure agencies and utilities have maybe a little bit slow to adopt, but there are tremendous opportunities to uh, find real cost efficiencies and service gains by adopting smart technology and to, and to achieve affordability, sustainability, and resilience, the triple crown. So infrastructure decision makers really need to become essentially future casters. Uh, the, we've got to factor, we can't just sort of replicate what we already have. It's not gonna do in, in the next decade or two. We really need to be factoring in climate change in a lot of the ways that Crystal and Amy described. We have technological revolutions and breakthroughs coming, coming along in a lot of areas of infrastructure technology uh, that, that need to be factored in and, and brought into these systems. Uh, we have shifting demographics. Uh, that, that graph on the right, um, on the lower right, forecasted versus actual US vehicle miles traveled. I'm gonna move away from the mic. Is this a disaster if I move over here just for a second? Okay, cool. Um, so this is the US Department of Transportation's predictions of total vehicle miles traveled by everybody in the country in their cars. Um, in, in the late 90s, 
They were predicting a straight line going up, the next year a straight line going up, the next year a straight line going up, and they've continued to predict year after year straight lines going up. This black line is the actual total vehicle miles traveled by people in the United States. So they've sort of missed this, <laughs> missed this wave entirely. Uh, and they have these models that are completely out of date and not factoring. In a lot of ways, young people are um, much more interested. Their, their, their identity is much more built around the device that they have in their pocket and their communication social, social networking than it is about having a hot new car in the way that previous generations were. So changing demographics, changing lifestyles of the next generation, those kind of things need to be factored in as well. We also can really <clears throat> Harness and leverage our infrastructure investments to build community prosperity. So infrastructure, as I mentioned, is a major job generator, vital to the local economy and local economic vitality. Uh, and so communities really need to integrate their economic development and their infrastructure investment strategies. And it's an opportunity to insource infrastructure jobs and potentially lift segments of the community uh, up who are too often left out of, uh, of, of our economy. And infrastructure is uh, a low barrier to entry um, sector. It, it doesn't, there are jobs that you can get into that are well paid that you can support a family on that don't require an advanced degree. Uh, but higher education, technical training, uh, very, very critical to build, build that pipeline of, of local talent so that, and we have an, in every one of these infrastructure sectors, we have an aging, graying workforce that are moving into retirement. So we have an urgent need to bring new people into this field. So the bottom line is we've got to figure out how to make infrastructure instead of boring and invisible, sexy, vital, attractive, interesting. We're running a serious infrastructure financial deficit. The workforce is aging in this, in this sector. Uh, and climate change is upon us. And we really need to shift how we, how we invest in these systems so that we can build a climate smart, resilient, low greenhouse gas kind of uh, infrastructure system. So we've got to galvanize the public, figure out how to make this a winning issue for elected officials. And I think affordability, sustainability, and resilience when you can combine those things, that can be attractive to elected officials. And we need to inspire a new generation to get into this business. Okay, I'll turn it over to Nan McKay. Thank you.